Hi, this is Graham Priest again, and this is the last of the short lectures we've been recording on logic. And what I want to do today is talk about some paradoxes. Last week we talked about dilethism, the view that some contradictions are true, and uh, I gave you some examples of things that some philosophers, at least, have thought were dilethic. These concern the law and they concern the limits of thought. But uh, I want to give you some more examples today of where you might think that dilethes occur and these concern exactly paradoxes. A paradox is often phrased as an argument which ends in a contradiction. And uh, a dilethic solution is essentially one that accepts the contradiction. I'm going to give you three examples of paradoxes and point out uh, what the dilethist would say about them. And the first one uh, concerns uh, some paradox of motion. Now, the paradoxes were produced, paradox of motion were produced by Zeno, uh, an ancient Greek philosopher, 5th or 6th century BCE, and uh, his paradox of motion had been discussed extensively by Western philosophers. It's only one of those that I want to uh, focus on today, and that's usually called the paradox of the arrow. So you must imagine that there is an arrow shot from the bow and it's on its way to the target. Now, take the arrow at any instant of its motion. At the instant, it makes no progress at all in its journey. Advance equals zero. But the whole journey is constituted by the sum total of these instants. So, if the progress made at any one instant is zero, then the progress made in the sum total of instants is zero. If you add naught to naught as many times as you like, even infinitely many times, you still get naught. Okay. So, this was Zeno's paradox of the arrow, that the arrow cannot move, it cannot make any progress in its motion. Now, uh, one way you can resolve the paradox is essentially as Hegel did. So Hegel said, well look, if you take the arrow at an instant of its motion, it's both here and not here at this same instant. And it's not here precisely because due to the fact it's in motion, it's already got a bit further and it's already lagging a bit behind. So the very fact of motion tells you that the arrow being here and not here, it's already gone a bit further. So the arrow actually does make progress in the instant, and so Zeno's paradox is broken. We talked about Hegel before, and this is essentially a Hegelian solution to the paradox of motion. Let me give you a second kind of paradox uh, of a very different kind. This is sometimes called, um, well, there's a family of paradox called the paradoxes of self-reference. And uh, the, easier of these to get, the easiest of these to get your head around is something called the liar paradox. It was invented or discovered by another ancient Greek philosopher, Eubulides, about the same time as Zeno's paradoxes, a little bit later. Uh, and it goes as follows. Suppose that I tell you this. This very statement that I'm now telling you is false. I ask you, is that true or is it false? Well, if it's true, well, it says it's false, so it must be false. And if it's false, well, hey, that's what it says, so it's true. So it seems to be true and false. Um, and that's exactly what a dilithist about matters takes it to be. That statement, the statement that what I'm now telling you is false, is both true and false. Now, you might think that um, the lie paradox is a bit of a party game. Uh, although logicians have taken it seriously, serious logicians have taken it seriously for 2,000 and up, 2,500 years now, but 
in the 20th century, it became impossible to treat it as not serious. And this is because um, it turned out to be, the paradox turned out to be one of a whole family of paradoxes of self-reference, which turned up in the foundations of mathematics. So what the issue here is the very nature and the ground of mathematics. And let me give you one of the other paradoxes in this family, which is um, relatively simple compared with some of them, uh, but let me try to explain it. So this is a paradox that was discovered by Bertrand Russell, and so it's called Russell's Paradox. And it's about sets, collections of things, which are mathematical objects of a certain kind. Now, um, some sets are not members themselves. So, for example, um, the set of countries in the world is not a country. So the set of countries in the world is not a country. It can't be a member of the set of countries. <coughs> but some sets are members of themselves. So um, the set of all abstract ideas, for example, is an abstract idea. And so it's a member of the set of all abstract ideas. So it would seem some sets are members of themselves and some are not. So far, so good. Now, what about the set of all those sets which aren't members of themselves? Okay. So this is a set which contains just those sets which are not members of themselves. Ask yourself whether this is or is not a member of itself. Well, if it is a member of itself, it's one of those things which is not a member of itself. So if it is, it isn't. And if it's not a member of itself, well, then it's one of those things that's in the set. So it is a member of itself. So it would seem to be both in the, the set and not in the set. So this is Russell's paradox. Now, um, the paradox of self-reference have occasioned a, an enormous literature in the 20th century, and this is not the place to go into it. Of course, people have suggested non dialectic solutions, but uh, often these seem to run into problems. Let me just illustrate this with the liar paradox. So recall the liar paradox was a claim that this very sentence that I'm now telling you is false. What we saw is that if it's true, it's false, and if it's false, it's true. Okay, that's fine. One natural response at this point is to say, well, yes, if it's false, it's true. If it's true, it's false. Maybe it's neither. So this is not a dialectic view. Uh, it's not saying it's both true and false. It's saying kind of the dual of that. It's neither true nor false. And some people have endorsed this kind of solution to the liar paradox. Now, the problem with this kind of solution is that it merely seems to shift the problem. Let me explain why. Let's tweak the liar sentence a little bit. Let's suppose that indeed it's neither true nor false, but now let's consider this sentence. <laughs> the sentence which I'm now telling you is either false or neither true nor false. What do we say about that? Well, if it's true, it's either false or neither true nor false. That's a contradiction, right? If it's false, well, then if it's false, it's either false or neither true nor false, but that's what it says. So it's true, and we're back with the contradiction. And now, suppose we try to say, well, it's neither true nor false. Well, if it's neither true nor false, then it's either false or neither true nor false. And so, since that's what it says, it's true. So we're back with this contradiction. So there isn't an easy way out by supposing that the liar sentence is neither true nor false. So, so far I've given you two examples of paradoxes and what a dialethist might say about them. One was Zeno's paradox of the arrow. The other was uh, paradox of self-reference. Uh, such as the liar paradox. Let me give you a third. Uh, this is a paradox sometimes called the Sorites. Uh, it was discovered by Eubulides, the same as the liar paradox, 
and uh, essentially it goes as follows. Uh, suppose you are completely sober and I give you one centiliter of alcohol, well then you're still sober, it has no effect on you. In fact, whatever your state, if you're sober and I give you one centiliter of alcohol, you're still sober. One centiliter just doesn't have a difference. So let's suppose you're sober and I give you one centiliter of alcohol, then you're still sober. I give you another, you're still sober. I give you another, you're still sober. Well, so eventually, of course, I give you uh, several litres of alcohol and you're blind drunk. But um, this is the Sorites paradox, that uh, adding one centilitre of alcohol to your bloodstream really cannot change you from being sober to being drunk, yet uh, eventually by adding single centilitres of alcohol to your bloodstream, you become drunk. Let me give you another example. This is to do with colours. Sometimes you see a colour spectrum. So I want you to imagine this. You've got a, a colour spectrum between, say, red and blue. So at this end of the, of the spectrum, it's very deep red, and then it sort of goes, very changes through sort of ready blue into blue. And uh, at this end, it's completely blue. Now, I want you to imagine that we cut this spectrum up into little slices, and that um, the changes are so slow that you can't tell the difference between the colour of one strip and the next. Uh, you can easily construct Sorites sequences such as this. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to do if you like. Now, um, the strip on this end is red. And if any strip is red, then the strip next to it is indistinguishable in colour. So that must be red too. So we have a Sorites situation. The first strip is red, the second strip is indistinguishable, so that strip is red, but the next strip is indistinguishable, so that strip is red too. So it's red all the way down, but of course, at this end, it's not red, it's blue. Now, this is the Sorites paradox, and it's a paradox of vagueness. The thing about predicates like is drunk, is red, is they're, they're vague. They don't seem to have any precise cutoff points. This is what causes the Sorites paradox. Now, what is one to say about solutions to the Sorites paradox? Well, a very standard thought is this. If you've got one of these Sorites sequences, there's a kind of middle area. So take the colour Sorites, for example. <clears throat> At this end, the strips are definitely red. At this end, the strips are definitely not red, they're blue. And in the middle, there's a kind of an area where, uh, well, it's, it's sort of symmetric. So the, the, the status of these things in the middle, these seem to be as much red as blue, as much red as not red. So it doesn't make much sense to say the things in the middle are red and only red. It doesn't make much sense to say the things in the middle are blue and only blue because the situation is symmetric. Okay, there are two symmetric possibilities. One is that these things in the middle are neither red nor blue, neither red nor not red. The other symmetric possibility is they're both red and not red, both red and blue. So that possibility is the dialectic solution. But uh, there is the other possibility namely that the things in the middle are neither red nor not red. So you might wonder, is there any reason to suppose the dialectic possibility is better than the other possibility, that the things in the middle are neither red nor not red? And um, matters are contentious, but here is at least one reason. If you think about the things in the middle, well, you wouldn't want to say they're green. You wouldn't want to say they're yellow. I mean, um, they're either red or blue. There's no third possibility, right? But if they're blue, they're not red. So if they're either red or blue, they're either red or not red. And if the claim that it's red was neither true nor false, well, then the claim that it was not red will be neither true nor false. So the claim that it's either red or not red wouldn't be true. So if that's right, you must have the other possibility. 
OK, so this is the third example of a dialectic solution to a well-known paradox. I've given you three. I've given you Zeno's paradox of the arrow, I've given you the Lie paradox, and I've given you the Sorites paradox. Now, I must stress that all these paradoxes are contentious, there is an enormous literature on these things, and logicians argue at great length about the possible solutions to these paradoxes, and particularly about whether a, a dialectic uh, paradox can be accepted. However, you can at least now see uh, why uh, you might be inclined to endorse dialethism. Well, this is the final lecture on logic. Uh, I hope now that you have some understanding of the nature of logic and some of the reasons why it's important, some of the things that it engages with, some of the issues in semantics and metaphysics, and why logicians consider logic to be a really important subject. And uh, if you've enjoyed thinking about some of the things we've been talking about, then I'm very happy.